Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on where you are, what time you're listening to this. My name is Winston, the content marketing guy. And today I'm super excited. I have a very special guest for you guys. Uh, her name is Sandra Diaz. I mean, someone who very astute uh, marketing background, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge. I'm very excited for, for her to actually come on and share with you guys today. I have no doubt whatsoever that, you know, she'd add a lot of value to this conversation uh, as well as you guys. You know, she was actually former assistant brand manager at Colgate. Um, then she moved on to become the brand manager at Sara Lee, you know, director of multicultural marketing at Sears, which is a title I'm, I'm very fascinated and interested in hearing more about that. Um, she was also the AVP at, at L'Oreal, and you know now she's a coach on Spark Career Catalyst, which another title I'm actually very, very interested to hear more about. So in terms of her background, I mean, she has been a part of some major corporations, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, you know, some of the top brands in the world that, you know, you and I both know about. So I know that she has a lot of knowledge and experience that she can share that can help not just you guys, but you know, every single one of us listening to this as well as myself. So Sandra, welcome to Conversation with Marketers. Well, thank you, Winston, for having me here as your guest and for allowing me to share my journey and my learnings in the process of going from corporate to entrepreneur. And, and, you know, obviously my, one of my passions is to share with other people so they don't have to reinvent the wheel like I did. <laughs> like you did. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's wrong with reinventing the wheel, but, you know, I'm very excited to, to hear more from you, definitely. So, yeah. you know, speaking of journey, Sandra, um, you know, with every one of my guests, I always like to know where are they coming from to where they are now. So, I'd love for you to really share your journey, you know, how you got involved in marketing, where it all started, you know, share your different experiences with different companies, different brands that you've worked for and worked with um, to where you actually are today. So my um, university degree was in industrial engineering. And the main thing an industrial engineer does is to improve processes and the way people do work. And my first jobs were with Eli Lilly, which is a pharmaceutical company, helping them to improve how they packed uh, medications in Colombia, South America. And then I moved on to Colgate Palmolive, where I worked with accountants. I did not know anything about accounting, but I changed the way they did their work by creating a big cross-functional team to improve the quality of their inputs to their process of cost accounting and then using computers to be able to streamline that process. And because of that, I was invited to be the assistant brand manager of one of the uh, five, one of the top five brands for our Colombian subsidiary. It's a scented cleaner called Fabuloso. And there in Colombia, um, being a, a smaller country of 40 million people, the system brand manager gets to do everything uh, from, you know, innovation to activation. Um, so I had a lot of different experiences. And then I decided that I wanted to get my MBA at Kellogg at Northwestern. So I went there for a couple of years and uh, did my internship at Citibank uh, with uh, credit card processes and how we marketed to existing card members. And then I went to Sara Lee and originally Sara Lee was a rotation program. Um, but the person who started the rotation program, that CEO left as I was coming in. So I ended up working in the international marketing department for Sara Lee and built it from just exporting to one country to launching the brand in over 20 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean and quadrupling the sales and profits for the business. And there actually, my boss really was my mentor in marketing and taught me a lot of the things that I, that I know and do today. Um, and one of the great things too was I said, I wanna go to the general US market. And so he helped me 
uh, to land a job as a brand manager for base business at Sara Lee. So I worked 100% US market, no international. But I really missed uh, the Latin flair. So <laughs> that's how I uh, went to Sears in a profession that combined both my love for culture and my love for marketing and brands in the US. So that's where I became director of multicultural marketing at Sears. And the beautiful thing is I had a boss who was a great, or who is still a great influencer in the field. And I had a hundred million dollar budget, uh, you know, compared to a Sears budget back in the day of like a billion dollars in marketing. So right. with that hundred million dollar budget, I got to do a lot of different things, you know, launch new product lines, do a lot of events and concerts, do Black History Month calendar. We also did Asian marketing. Um, launched the first online site for Sears uh, in Spanish that fed new clients into Sears.com. So a lot of a lot of new innovative things. And um, Sears was acquired by Kmart back at the time. And right. so I left Sears and I worked for a season at a small agency that did activation. I wanted to be in the beauty industry every time in my career journey, I've always questioned, where am I? What is my ideal job and how do I get there? And so every time, like I said before, it was like, oh, I miss, I, I wanna get US experience. So went and got that job. And then, well, I sort of miss Latin America and I wanna combine it with US and went for multicultural and got that job. And then it was, I wanna be in beauty. So I went to a small agency first working on the Dove brand and then went to L'Oreal to lead multicultural marketing. But because I had retail experience, I also ended up being the head of customer marketing for a season there. And there came a point in my career where because I did multicultural marketing, it required me to influence everybody in the organization from, I always said, from the janitor to the CEO to be able to make an organization relevant to audiences that are not, let's say, quote unquote, the mainstream. Um, but it got to a point where I felt that it was a tiring process for me and I wanted to sort of prove my case by going out there and launching a business that sold directly to those consumers that I was trying to convince the company to sell to. And so that's what launched my journey in entrepreneurship. And the interesting thing, though, that was that I was too corporate for my own good when I first <laughs> started being an entrepreneur. So I really couldn't figure out how to launch a business or build a team quickly. And that was something that I learned over time. My, my first venture was video-based education for Latino entrepreneurs. So probably very similar to maybe to something that you pursue here. But that was back in the day of no Coursera or Udemy or anything like that. So, so I just couldn't figure out like, what's the business model and how is this going to work? And I knew how to write a business plan on paper or do right. a strategy. Um, but I always worked with millions of dollars to do stuff. So when you have millions of dollars and your personal paycheck doesn't depend on it, it's very different than when you have to launch your own business, bootstrap figure out if you really have clients, make it work. So anyway, that business ended up not going anywhere, but I started consulting companies on how to do innovation and marketing for Hispanics. And, and so I learned a lot of things in that process. And along the way, I also, uh, I've always had mentoring as a hobby. And I created a job search group at a church, which eventually became what today is LandDreamCorporateJobs.com, which is an online system. It's a seven-step system that allows women and minorities to get more interviews and offers in 90 days. So that's, that's where I am today. And I also, <laughs> by the way, in that process of working with women and minorities, and a different thing that happened to me, I actually met a human trafficking victim and helped her and long story short, I ended up working for the nonprofit. So my day job is I work at a nonprofit that helps women who are foreign nationals in the U.S. who have been trafficked to get back on their feet. I'm the director of economic empowerment at that nonprofit. 
and we do job readiness, job placement, and job retention for those women. And then by night, I do coaching for corporate people that want to land dream jobs. And the interesting thing is actually both of them dovetail from each other because it's primarily women and minorities that I serve in both uh, services. Wow. <laughs> I have so many questions. <laughs> It's like as you were as as you were talking, um, and you said something. I'm like, oh, I need to ask a question about that. Oh, I need to ask a question about that because I mean, so much experience, so much, you know, that you've done throughout your entire career, and still very young, um, yes. you know, based on the the amount of experience that you've had and how long you've been doing this. So I guess my first question is, how was it different for you to move from really? Um, you know, working in Colombia, um, you know, that Latino flavor, as you put it, to know, you know, managing a, a brand on the international level, like what were the differences for you? And, you know, were there any mistakes that you made? And what did you actually learn from those mistakes? So when I worked in Colombia, Colgate is a very, very well-known brand in Colombia. And usually well-known brands have established uh, processes, established products, um, established way to do innovation. And I actually had a fantastic boss then as well. So, so I felt like it was more, I was executing something that I was already a system I could follow. Like I didn't have to invent so many things. When I went to Sarah Lee, everything was f to be invented. Um, I had a very strong boss that had been a big leader at Unilever and at Clorox. So he knew what we're looking for. So that helped. Right. But my strength is in developing systems and processes. So I sort of took his vision and, and his ideas of like how to make things work. And I was the person who organized, you know, how are we going to go get distributors? What are the uh, you know, contracts we need, what are the marketing um, information we need, how do we create a co-op marketing program so we give them money but they also invest so to give them an incentive. Um, I really didn't do a lot of selling but it was different because also these distributors wanted to distribute Sara Lee. It wasn't like later on in my career where I'm trying to sell something and convincing other people they need it here it was easy because they wanted it. We just had to figure out how to distribute it with them. So it made sense. So we made money, they made money and right. we grew the, the business. Um, so there, uh, I don't, I don't, I feel those were like my golden years. Like I couldn't do anything wrong because all, the only way we could <laughs> go up was up. Right. So launch another country, make more money. Um, I think maybe it just when you work with distributors, it's more of a learning that like everybody is not going to be a star distributor. Um, so we always had stars that we worked with and others that we didn't worry too much about. Like we didn't invest too much energy in them. So maybe one learning would be everybody's, you know, all your children are not created equal, right? Some, some of those <laughs> distributors are going to get more resources than others just based on their response and their, their ability to move volume, which at the end of the day, that's what you want when you're selling a brand, right? You need to move, you need to reach certain sales targets. Right. Um, the other thing I learned in that process from my boss was we always did um, some time, some kinds of co uh, contests for the salespeople those were always very motivating for the distributors and that included being able to have them come to the U.S. Sometimes it was like simple things like just come to the U.S. to a gathering where we had awards and things like that. Um, and so, and so that is another thing I took as a learning, like how to motivate with those types of tools for, especially when people are internationally dispersed, like there's not a sense of community. Right. Um, and so we had to create that through those contests and, and uh, experiences. All right, great. So as, as the director of multicultural marketing, I, I told you I, I needed to come, come back to that. <laughs> yeah. The director of multicultural marketing at Sears. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, not just dealing with 
people at different levels, you know, from the janitor all the way to the CEO, but then you also have different cultures and, you know, having an understanding of those cultures and being able to lead in such a way where you can relate as a leader to each person, whether at different levels or within different cultures. How, how was that for you? Was it something that was easy for you? Was it hard? How exactly did you navigate that space to be able to you know, create the type of business results that you needed to? So it, I actually thought it was a very, very difficult season. I, find, I found it pretty um, uh, just grueling for me personally. Back then, I didn't understand why that was the case. But now that I know myself better, over time, I've learned, I don't know if you're familiar with the Clifton Strengths Finders, um, but I've actually learned through that. That's an assessment you can take online. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I have found that of my top five strengths, three of them are strategic. One is execution and only one is an influencing skill. <laughs> and so the reason why I always was able to grow in my career was because I have those strategic strengths that are extremely, you know, they're three of my top five. So I was, uh, have always been able to talk big picture and, and where we're heading and vision and innovation. And so that's how I ended up in the leadership role. But it turns out that I, for multicultural marketing, my strongest strength you know i just don't have that ability to naturally you know because these are these things are about like what are your natural talents and then how you build them into strengths my natural self is not to be out there convincing other people and motivating them and rah rah <laughs> so it was just really hard because i yeah i'm more like of a data and process person than a you know try to figure out how to connect with you and get you to see the vision I'm seeing, that's really hard for me. So the good news is, I think back then at Sears, what helped me was that, that well, first of all, my boss resigned at some point in the equation. And, and uh, my boss actually had uh, suggested that I got promoted to that director role, and, and, but the CMO interviewed me and she said, she's not ready. But instead of the CMO just saying she's not ready and calling it a day, my boss left. So she actually assigned somebody of her trust. This is, we also experienced like uh, CMO change. You know, there were a lot of things happening, right? So this was a new CMO. Um, and she had brought in somebody that she trusted to work with her, like as a right-hand person to navigate all the other people. And so basically she assigned me to that person to work with me closely. And that's how I was able to do my job well, because I had somebody like a mentor or sponsor sort of helping me figure out how to navigate all the issues. So that, that helped a lot, but it was very taxing too, because I had to manage. I remember like a, like at least five agencies. I had a team of three or two to direct reports actually three direct reports. I had a magazine we produced, like I had a lot of people to, to manage. And again, that wouldn't be my natural strength either. Uh, but it really helped me to have that mentor to be able to have perspective. Um, and I think the mistakes I made there was, I, I just didn't know anything about like, how do you sell your ideas internally? Like what is a process? Because again, I think in terms of process, so I think the, the lesson learned for people is you have to know yourself to know what works for you so you yeah. can then make it work for you, right? So if I had known that there was a process for internal selling versus sort of this mystical gift that people have to do it or not do it, um, you know, once I learned that process, I'm like, oh, I can do that. You know, like I can systematically get into somebody else's head and what they need and try to make it happen. But I didn't know that then. So it was just more like me working very hard and thankfully have this mentor. But it was, uh, I would say, a pretty painful process back then. <laughs> and I can definitely relate to what you're saying because I'm exactly the same way as well, where I'm very, I'm more of a strategic critical thinker. I'm not really like, you know, being able to navigate well. But then I, I, I should say, 
I wasn't that type of person to really know how to connect with people, you know, to really, as you say, motivate, convince them to really get them to move, to get whatever job done. So, I mean, I can be honest, I was a very bad leader. You know, I really sucked at it back, back in the day. But a book that really helped me was um, John Maxwell's The Five Levels of Leadership. You know, where he start, he spoke about, you know, the positional leader versus the people leader and the, the I don't remember the exact terms he used, but mm. pretty much the five levels, it's all about the first is positional, meaning someone that points you as a leader. Mm. The second one is people where, you know, this is the soft skills that, you know, you were just mentioning that you had to learn over time. Um, and then the third level is, I guess, more where your strength lie is having those processes, that strategy that can actually achieve business results for yourself and the entire organization. So I, I, I definitely know exactly what you're, you're talking about, but the good thing is that, and, and this I'm actually sure about, is because you had that experience, what you're doing now, it allows you to be much better in terms of mentoring people, being able to help them, because now you have both strengths, you have, the strategic side but you've also developed the the people side as well um that can help you know it's kind of like that that one two punch if you want to call it that yeah and also because I, again my biggest aha came from knowing who i am and how i'm designed and two knowing that for my type of person i have to go find well how does that get done so i can just follow that that's what works for me so, so I think it's just, first of all, even realizing you needed it. And second, that, that just, I have to work with who I am as a person, not trying to be somebody else. Right. And, and that's an advice that everyone listening should, should pretty much take, you know, being self-aware and knowing what works for you, um, you know, to help you move forward. You started off saying that you, because you spent so many years in corporate, you know, pretty much all the systems were in place. Um, you already had, you know, billion dollar budget, you know, I guess you moved to, to a hundred million dollar budget, but still pretty significant, um, you know, with a, with a big company, with an enterprise level company to know being a small business owner, doing your own thing, having to bootstrap, having to, you know, hire, having to create all those processes and systems for yourself, you know. Talk to us about that transition from corporate to being a small business owner. I, same again. I guess it's like you know. I guess you have to be patient with yourself. You know, learning by learning by doing, and then sort of not doing it well, and then eventually <laughs> there's an emerging of like, oh, this is what I need. I always I realize I think in my entrepreneur journey. That same as you gain experience in any job, right? When you're corporate, you start in the junior level and then you gain experience and you start like, you know, come, uh, increasing in responsibility. It was the same for me as an entrepreneur. I actually had to gain years of experience operating as an entrepreneur to do it well. I I'm, I'm have to say I'm amazed at those people who are like 20 and they just sort of kind of figure it out easily uh and and create like a runaway sensation but reality is i think only like about 10 percent of businesses actually make it right so it's not it's not an easy thing to do um so i was saying how i was too corporate for my own good with my first venture and it was what i struggled with was trying to figure out like how is it what is the business model because i wanted to give the education free but then I wanted to like sell something in return for that. Like same as like now, again, now I've learned a lot about like lead generation and like how you can do the freemium model and all that stuff. But back then it was pretty early in time. And, and even it wasn't as easy to do video based um, education. So that, that was my vision to make it more democratic and be able to offer freemium. But I was just like, how am I going to make money? And I couldn't. And I wrote a business plan. So I did all the right things that I knew to do. But I just didn't know how to do what's called a lean startup. So what I learned in all those years of wandering in the desert was, I, and I eventually did buy a coaching from um, 
from a really, really good uh, person. And she, back in the day, she didn't charge a lot of money and her name's escaping me right now. But if, you know, if any of your listeners ever wants to uh, know the info, you can just email me and I'll tell you. Um, she had, she taught this lean startup coaching and, and that's where I learned that you can go to market with this minimum viable product and it can be so minimum, but your goal is to see if people will buy it. And then if people buy that minimum, you build on that. So landreamcorporatejobs.com started my minimum viable product was I did a webinar. So I did come up with my seven steps to, you know, to land your dream job. Um, but all I had to do was I just did a webinar and I had watched enough webinars from like online courses and stuff to know how to create it. So to sell something at the end, right. but the, basically the goal of that webinar was to see if anybody would buy my product. And I priced it as a, I, and I said, this is a beta test and it's $200. But still, for an individual looking for a job, $200 is a good investment. So that's the way where I tested. And I actually got, I invited just friends and family. And I got six clients from that. And then the basis of that webinar helped me create what I have today, meaning because I recorded all the boot camp that I sold to people. Um, and I developed templates for them, right? Because I had to deliver something in exchange of them for the $200. Um, and, and the best thing though, was that one, I proved that people would buy a product from me or that type of product. And two, that I actually got success stories. So everybody I worked with that followed the system, even one person that wandered in the desert for a while, everybody got a job and not only a job, but I, they got the exact job that they wanted. And I had people with career hiatuses of like 10 years. And for example, that mom had been out for 10 years and she was able to land another director job in the, her profession she had before she left her career. So, so with those two things, I had confidence. I did one thing I have done though, in the entrepreneur journeys, I have invested in, in systems with people who sort of know for example, eventually I invested in a system to figure out how to sell online courses because there is, again, people have gone before you and know how this works. So once I invested in that, I was able to refine my target market, refine my offering and charge like six times what I was originally charging in the beta test. So now my average client is buying a coaching that costs about $1,300. Um, and I, and the other thing is I did interview eventually some of my clients that bought the product and the ones that didn't buy the product and tried to figure out what was the barrier. And I found, for example, one barrier was people wanted to make monthly payments. So I figured out how to do all of that on the way, but it, I never had to invest a boatload of money until I proved like step by step how things work. Then now I feel like I have a business model that works where I'm making good money. Um, now my next challenge is I was having a hard time figuring out how to acquire the customers um, because Facebook ads and all that stuff is good, but you have to have proven your model, like your target and everything is, is working to get the payout. So for me, it took, it's taken like about a year to figure out who's truly my target market and who will gravitate toward my product and download my ebook. And now I'm more ready to, to pursue those avenues to be able to grow the business bigger. Awesome. And, and you said two things that, that I want to, to emphasize. Um, the first of which is that you didn't create the product first and say, all right, let me go out there and start a business and you know just do like a, a hard launch which is, is something a lot of business owners do a lot of people do you know they, they have this product they have this idea and their assumption is because it's a good idea to them or even if it's a good idea to them and probably a few friends and family they automatically believe that all right everyone is going to love what i offer because i love it or because these three people that i know <laughs> says it's a good idea 
and mm -hmm. that's what you know often causes them to to fail in in business because there's no there's no product market fit in terms of people who will actually pay as you said because yeah it may be a good idea but who will actually you know take out money and pay you for this particular product um or service and and another thing that you mentioned which is something that i talk about also where you have two different customers you have your assumed customer and your actual customer and your assumed customer is who you believe or who you think will actually buy your your product but oftentimes the person who you think will buy your product is actually not the person who buys your product it's usually the person who you are not even thinking about in the first place and and that that aha moment for you um that actually came absolutely yes and and also i i struggled for a while trying to pinpoint my target market um because i was afraid to go too niche i uh, and then the other thing i also was worried about was you know who's gonna pay for job search coaching when you don't have a job <laughs> <laughs> right um so so eventually it has and and also i had to leverage my experience as well because in some types of businesses you have to have credibility in the space a lot of the businesses i've done are based on thought leadership um again because that's sort of my strength but though in those businesses you have to have credibility for people to buy from you so by focusing on women and minorities wanting to land corporate jobs basically i can say okay i did it this is how i did it and then people they that gives them the confidence to buy and pay those kinds of prices um but you know again i really admire those people that like from scratch out of nowhere uh you know they just have this vision and and obviously they hit i think the key is you hit on a pain point that somebody has or an aspiration that's very big and then right. you're delivering it in a way where the where the result is clear for the other person and it's a result they want because many times we're trying to sell people features right right but we don't sell them the outcome and that happens to people when they are trying to get a new job. Everybody talks about, oh, I have all these skills or I've done these things. But in the end, what people want is, can you do certain results? And people, generally speaking, it's very hard for us to communicate. This is the result you're going to get if you invest your money here. And that result has to be appealing. Um, so that's, that's the process that it takes a while to get it right. Um, so, so anyway, it, that, that's the journey. And the, I guess the, cha the other challenge is to how are you going to uh, make it work cash flow wise, right? Because if you're going to live off of that for, you know, directly, then you have to go get investors. Um, and that was sort of what I struggled with my first business is like, I, I had to figure out how is this business going to make money so that if I asked somebody to invest in this business. How are they going to eventually get their money back? Because if I cannot show them how they're going to get their money back, guess what? They're not going to invest. I mean, who would, right? So, right. so that's the part where I could not figure out like how, how would, I, and now I've seen a million businesses that do something similar. And I was like, ah, I didn't think about that. And I actually, I forgot to say something about one of my other struggles with being an entrepreneur is because I am not as naturally strong on influencing skills, it was very hard for me to, to envision, like, how am I going to bring other people into this venture to make it grow? And I think successful entrepreneurs are able to do that better. Um, so they're able to sort of bring together, like, the right people to the team. And then, like, it's five of them trying to make it work. Uh, but you know, working with people is also not so easy as well, you know, so you have to be very clear on what each one expects and so on and so forth. But I think successful entrepreneurs are able to build those teams. And for me, that was really hard. Now I, I ended up working in all this journey. I consulted for a startup, a financial, uh, fintech startup. And, and I learned a little bit more about like how to, as an entrepreneur, build a team of people without, you know, sort of testing and learning even the people, 
you know, uh, which is a whole other aspect of entrepreneurship. Right. And, you know, since, since you're on the point that you mentioned earlier about, you know, helping people get jobs, people who had been in, you know, hiatus coming back um, after 10 years, which is, <laughs> I would consider that to be your miracle worker because I, I don't even know how that's possible to, to come back after 10 years and get a director level position. But I think it's something that, everyone listening in the audience would love to know whether that person is you know someone who's an entrepreneur who tried to make it but realized that probably this is not their thing and they need to go back into corporate or go back into the working world or someone who is probably a job seeker whether they're a marketer or or otherwise doesn't really matter could you walk us through your your seven steps in terms of how someone can do that, you know, someone who is either a job seeker trying to find a job or someone who has been out of a job for a while, you know, for one reason or another, but decided now that, all right, they want to go back um, into the workforce to pick up where they left off. Yes. So, so first of all, the first step in my system is you have to have a system and work it daily. Um, many job seekers, you know, job seeking is emotionally draining. So sometimes some people don't, are not consistent with their search strategies because they let emotions dictate what they're doing. And, and so having a system actually cuts your time by 33% for your search time. So it's have a system, could be mine, could be somebody else's, but have a system and work it daily. Second step is you have to pick your target market. So the problem with job seekers many times is they haven't picked which industry they can make the outcome happen, that they can make happen. So think about this, like usually people, when you're hiring, you're like, if you have two candidates and somebody had experience in that industry that you were working in, you're going to gravitate toward that person. Again, it's the credibility factor. So it's trying to figure out what types of industries and jobs where you know you can make an impact. The third thing is you have to communicate what you can deliver as a result, not as a skill, right? So it's different to say, I have 10 years of marketing experience, great, versus, you know, I can save you time and money and avoid costly mistakes when launching products for Hispanics, right? So people want to avoid mistakes. So they're going to hire me for that. But if I just say I have Hispanic marketing experience, okay, great. But again, you're not selling people by results, right? So you have to, in step three in my system, it's like, how do you communicate that in a very succinct and pointed way in your LinkedIn, when you pitch people, when you meet people, right? When you even talk to your friends, you'd be amazed. Like some of our friends, we don't know what they do, but it's like nobody tells you their success story or it's always, oh, life is terrible. I'm looking for a job and nobody wants me. But as a friend, like I can't help somebody if I don't know what they accomplish for somebody else, right? So, right, right. Um, the fourth step is connecting to those decision makers in your target market and showcasing your expertise and seeking to serve them. That was one thing I learned actually as an entrepreneur when I was doing consulting that, that all of a sudden I realized uh, that I only had two people in my entire network who could actually hire me to do Hispanic marketing and innovation. So I had to fix that. I had to go find who are my decision makers, get them in my network, and then add value to them. Another mistake job seekers make, which is it's all about me, me, me. I don't have a job for me versus like, hey, what do you need? What are you looking for? Let me give you information because I'm out there. When you're searching for a job, you're in a privileged position of being able to look at the landscape in a bigger way. So you can add value to people in, in the measure that you add value people are going to see you as an expert number one and two you, normally there's like a reciprocation of of you know if you've done something for somebody somebody's going to be okay let me give you at least some advice to get to this company many times they'll take your resume in um so and then the fifth step is the online black hole of applications you know you can always apply online 
But the best and ideal thing to do is see how you can directly engage a hiring manager, again, with an outcome and inviting them to a dialogue. Some companies are frown upon you direct, uh, directly reaching the hiring manager. It really depends. Part of that process of, of direct connections, maybe you start with peers to get the lay of the land. And if it's okay to send an email to the hiring manager, you do that. Other ways, um, and my, my person who, who got a job after a 10-year career hiatus was because we both been, went to a prestigious business school. She did have contacts. She just, they were dormant. But she happened to reach out to somebody she had seen a year ago at an alumni reunion and said, oh, hi, I saw you're connected to this other person. I just want to know what their email address is, if I have it correctly. I'm not asking you to refer me or anything. I just want to know because I want to send them a letter with this thing. And the person actually knew her well enough to be like, hey, not a problem. Let me just take your resume. And that's how she got the job. Um, Obviously, she's a qualified person. She, she had done research on the company. She had a, a compelling outcome-focused letter that said, this is what I can do for the company. So, so for the classmate trying to get her in, it, it, she didn't make the person hard, work too hard to help her, right? right so right. he could say, she can do this for you. It was an easy sell. Um, the sixth thing is when you go to an interview, very critical step that nobody does. You have to talk as much as ask questions to figure out what people's pain points are and then show them how you're going to help them solve those pain mm, points. People usually don't go to interviews thinking it's like a sales call. They just think about like, tell me about yourself. And they just blab, blab, blab. Next question, blab, blab, blab. They never ask the interviewer questions that invite dialogue. So, so you... By the way, you leave the interview thinking you did fantastic and you never asked anything and then they never call you and you don't even know why. But it's like you never asked a bunch of questions that would help you know if you're the right fit for the, for right. the job or not. And, and, it's, and I think even though interviewing is such a painful process because you feel rejected, the bottom line is people are not buying you as, let's say, your service. You, they're not hiring you many times just simply because they have some things in mind that they need. And even though you're a great person, it's just you don't perfectly meet those needs. Right, and, right. and I like to say it's not personal. And I know people are like, oh, but it's me. It is personal. They rejected me. But it's more like it's simply you. you yeah, you don't have the one, two, threes that they needed. And your job in that interview was to find out what they had. And many times just by asking those questions, the interviewer might sway in your favor simply because you listened to what they needed and you tried to meet them with your solution. Um, and then the seventh step is, especially for women and minorities, we have to be very savvy about negotiating our pay because chances are we are going to be paid less than white males. Yeah. <laughs> so just preparing and knowing how to answer that question of what is your target compensation early on so you keep your options open and make sure you surround yourself with a few friends that when you get the offer, you know, there's a way to make sure you the offer is open for negotiation. But then surround yourself by some friends that are going to, you know, you're going to write out what you want and, and sound friendly but also like how do you negotiate to make sure you get the best compensation possible and all of these things um, are in a free ebook that uh, can be found at landdreamcorporatejobs.com people can download it and then i always give people a free 30-minute consultation once they've worked through the ebook tried some things and have some questions to see how they can tailor it for themselves all right awesome Wow, I I love that. I I particularly loved step six because, as a marketer who wants to reach a particular audience or customer, that's how I. Or even when I used to do sales, that's how I used to approach it. I I've never gone into a sales meeting for the first time with with a potential um, client thinking that I'm going to try and sell them. It's always let me learn as much as possible about their challenges, their pain points, what is that they hope to accomplish. And then how can we position the solution to show them, you know, this is how the solution can help them. 
but now framing it in the context of an interview, which which it's so weird because I, I've never thought about that before. But, you know, just the mere fact that you're saying it now, it, it blew my mind just thinking about it. Like, yeah, that, that, that could actually work. That could actually be, be effective. Yeah, so because that, at the end of the day, you're selling us so yourself as the solution to a problem they have. And if you don't know what the problem is that they have, then how are you going to ever speak relevantly to what they want? Because we all have done, imagine I go to an interview. I've told you a million things I've done, right, in my career. So, so if I don't focus on what is the reason why they brought me in here, then, then and I go all over the place, they're going to be like, I don't know what she does. Maybe she's not the right person. Yeah, and, and not to worry, guys. I, I know a lot of you will be very anxious to get that piece of content, that information, but don't worry. I'll, I'll put a link um, in the actual you know, blog post when I, when I actually publish this. So don't worry about it, guys. I'll put a link for you to actually be able to go to that page and, and download the content. I'm going, you know, let me just bring you back to your, your corporate um, where, you start, where, where you started. You have experience in, you know, the B2B environment, B2C environment. What I'd, lovely, what, what, what I'd love to find out from you is, you know, do you consider that there's a distinction between, between both? And there's a reason why I ask, because this is just my belief. I, I think there is, but I was actually reading a post that someone did on LinkedIn that says there isn't. Um, uh, much of a difference or distinction. So I'd love your take on that. First of all, that one, do you believe there, there's a difference and what that difference is? And the second question to that is, how do you actually drive sales and customer acquisition from a B2C standpoint versus a B2B standpoint? Okay, so, so what I would agree is that both B2B and B2C entail you have to identify the target market. You have to identify what's the outcome that they're looking to achieve. And somehow you have to get the information about you as the solution to their problems. Yeah, so that somebody can buy. Nobody can buy if they don't know you exist. And also nobody can buy if the outcome you're promising doesn't meet their need. Right? So in that sense, marketing is marketing. But with B2B, first of all, you're selling to a person that is inside a company, right? So, so the buying process is different because they not only are answering for themselves, but they have to answer to a boss in many cases. The other thing is corporations tend to buy products that are, you know, or services that are thousands of dollars in value. So when somebody's going to make that kind of investment, with a bunch of decision makers, like it's a different process. Uh, when you're selling to consumers, you're generally selling a, a, an item that doesn't have a high ticket price unless you're like, for example, I'm selling a, a coaching product that has a high ticket price for an individual. So the selling process may be a little bit more of a hybrid. Uh, but like if you're selling $20 things to people, it's very different than if you're selling, you know, thousands of dollars. Right. So so I find that in the B2B historically, and, and even now with online, it, it's a process of uh, creating compelling content that can engage people to see that you're the expert. So you might be delivering that content online. You might be delivering that content in trade shows, in speaking engagements. Uh, in B2B, you are more trying to get qualified leads like an actual person. In B2B, you actually have to go sell face-to-face <laughs> -to, -face to somebody, ideally, um, and, and hear their objections and understand their process and, and you know, sell a solution, ask a lot of questions. Versus I feel that in B2C, again, depends on that category, but in most B2Cs, you're doing, you're advertising your outcome in a mass channel. And it could be mass to me is like anything that attracts a lot of people at the same time. So it could be even an event, but it's right. still like a good number of people. And sometimes, you know, now with 
online and social media, you can make your, your B2C advertising more relevant on a very individual basis, or at least on a segment basis in a way that you couldn't do before when I started my career. But still, you're rarely talking to a person one-on-one -on -one that's a buyer, especially if your item is 20 bucks, right? You're not talking to that direct buyer to find out their pain points and all this kind of stuff that you have right. to do to be. <laughs> You're just, you're just have something that promises an outcome. They're buying it. If they're buying it, that means your promise is good. If they're not buying it, I guess you got to go back to the drawing board. Um, in my case, even though I have a B2C business because of the high price tag for coaching, I do use a funnel that's more like B2B. So I have an ebook that qualifies people as somebody who's interested in looking for a job. I have a free 30 minute consultation that allows me to have that sales conversation with a person meaning when i say sales conversation it's what is it that they need why is it they're not getting the results they want in their job search do i have something to offer them or not you know and, and it's that's one thing i learned about selling that you know i i have a solution in it this is what it is and if people don't feel it's what they need or they're not ready to invest that amount of money it's okay. It's not, I haven't failed. They haven't failed. It's what people will invest if they see the possibility. Um, that is, and in my case, I can cut down their search time significantly. I can get people who have been in a long career hiatus a job because I've done it before, right? I, I know that if people work my system in 90 days, usually they're landing the job. And if not landing, they've got more interviews than they ever got before right so but again those are things i can promise people but but they have to decide if they want to invest the money to get that result or not so so yeah so i feel that in that sense um you know in the end as a marketer you always have to have a promise the promise has to be relevant and you have to communicate it somehow but the channels i would say and the methods are different Right. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. So one of the, the biggest challenges that marketers face, um, you know, that I have I've realized is and and it's funny because as I'm seeing it, I'm I'm thinking and I'm remembering that it seems to be the challenge for, you know, really almost if not every marketer, how to get that buying from management for certain marketing campaigns. Because even now that you mentioned the whole, you know, identifying pain points and all of that, and you, you connected it to a person who is a job seeker, you know, in that interview process, probably you can tell me how you can use that same system or something similar to sell ideas. Marketers can, can sell their ideas and, and, and show the value to management why they believe this particular marketing campaign or this particular marketing initiative is a good investment for the company how, how could how can someone as a marketer do that and that this is exactly what i didn't know when i worked at sears and didn't know when i worked at l'oreal that i wish i had known you know it took me all these entrepreneur years to figure it out um, and also like you know to again when your livelihood depends on the sale the stakes are a lot different, right? Than when you're in, and especially when I worked in marketing, other people sell the product. I didn't sell, right? So, so what I've learned is you have to treat your internal selling like any selling, right? So again, the principle of like, you have to understand who are, who is your target market? Who are those key decision makers? Sometimes people see that the decision makers only like this one boss, but it turns out that that boss is influenced by other people. So, so you can get champions from a lot of different places. Just you have to outline like who are those champions, and then you have to understand what is it that that motivates them. And and me being me, I tend to my. I tend to look at pain points very much about the business, but reality is sometimes people are motivated by ego, by being the first person to see the light and do this idea. You know, like people are, have different 
reasons, right? So it's, it's not just about pain points, but also aspirations. So it's like you have to write down your people you want to influence, try to understand them, observe them. One thing I never did in meetings was like I didn't, and I still, it's hard for me to do because I get not my natural strength, but I didn't sit in meetings and observe people and try to figure out like what makes them tick, what is their soapbox, right? So I could never speak to people because I'm not even observing them. <laughs> um, and then, and then you, it's a process of getting clearer, like what is it that they want to need? And then eventually you have to ask them for a meeting to talk about what you want to talk about. But again, it's like that sales meeting we talked about and like the interview. Don't just come and say, blah, 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 my idea. It's more like, okay, let's confirm. What are your challenges or, or, you know, like what are some things that excite you? Let's say if the person's motivated by like being the first champion and then sort of saying, what do you think about this idea and presenting either a solution or that aspiration and seeing if you can get the person to quote unquote buy being your, your champion. And then once you have several champions, it's easier to like do the meeting with the ultimate decision maker and then everybody's yeah we think this is a great idea it's not just you speaking um again for women and minorities uh it's we have to work a more a system with steps and stuff because we don't have natural sponsors generally uh compared to white males so so this is just something you have to be very systematic you also have to work it every day you know not get down because I don't know, somebody didn't like your thing because there's, there will always be people who are going to get on board and other people who are not going to get on board. Um, and eventually, by the way, in some cases, like if you're not getting support in your company across the board for a long period of time, then I guess it, sometimes it's time to find a new job because, you know, if you're not being able to sell your ideas and you've done all your best, then it's like probably it's like any sales, right? Your product's not selling, then gotta pivot. Yeah, and and I'm glad you mentioned the whole the part about finding a new job because a lot of people find that very difficult. As a matter of fact, I think it was not this week; it was last week. I was having a conversation with a young lady, you know, someone who saw my content on LinkedIn, reached out to me and said, "Hey." Um, you know, I'd love to get your, your input on, you know, content marketing and how we can apply it to the company. And just based on what she was telling me, I could immediately, because I've experienced that as well. As a matter of fact, I've experienced it twice where I'm trying to get buying for content marketing, but, you know, the, the CEOs in both instances just, just wasn't really, I mean, that. They said they were listening, but you could tell that they weren't based on the fact that yeah. they'll agree to the strategy, but when it comes to the actual execution, there's no support for it. Um, and then they may say something like, well, you know, this over here is more important. So let's just abandon that strategy for now and let's focus here on direct selling. And I was telling her that, you know, the reality of it is if it is that you're trying to get a buy and you're not getting it, because funny, because she is a minority plus a female, uh, <laughs> probably it's just a case where you just have to, you know, find another job, find somewhere else where they may be more open to your ideas and what you have to say. Yeah. And, and the thing, though, is, but first, the person needs to do the process of being more systematic about their selling, which like I said, I didn't know what I didn't know when I was inside the corporation. So I didn't know, oh, I have to have a system to figure out how to get these people on board. It yeah. felt to me like, based on my personality, people should like, like me and want to do my thing. And that was never going to work for me because I'm just not a personality inside right. a company because that, I think process. so. So once I figure out what worked for me, some other people actually can sell based on personality. Great for them. Go do that and then be systematic about it. But for me, I had to be like, okay, what is the process that I can follow? And, it, and no matter what, for example, the person you spoke to, the question for her would be, let's say she's trying to sell content marketing in her organization, right? She would have to be like, 
who are the people who I need to influence? What are the things they're struggling with? Or maybe where they want to lead. And, and you can, now with social media, you can gain so many insights in addition to observing them in real life. You can also get insights on like what they're promoting and talking about and what they're proud of or whatever. So like there's so much intelligence you can gather on the people you can influence. And then you have to walk the talk, especially in content. Content marketing is about creating relevant content that will show you to be the expert in that field and will draw people to want to do business with you, right? And do business right. could be basically sponsor your idea. So you, you, that person could start doing their own version of content marketing inside the company to prove, you know, based on content marketing, how to do content marketing, right? So, and, and by the way, in addition, maybe that person can begin to establish themselves as a leader in the content marketing field externally by using social media, basically apply the principles and become the guru. And then maybe people will listen to. So there's a lot of steps before, before quitting your job. There's a <laughs> lot of things you can put in place. My point is there's a point in time after which you do have to examine whether you are uh, getting the support and listening. And if, if this company in particular is not buying your expertise, hopefully with the other things you're doing, there's going to be another company that will. Yeah. And, and, you know, the reason why, why I laughed when, when you said, because you, you kind of brought me back, um, you know, in your remembrance to, to why I even started the content marketing guy in the first place, which was, that's the exact reason I was trying to sell the idea of content marketing, you know, to my bosses, you know, both of them was two separate companies, but they just weren't following through with it. And, you know, eventually I got frustrated and, and I said to myself, you know what, I'm just going to go out and do it myself, show that it actually works, show that it's something that's, that's of value, um, not just to them necessarily, but just to the entire marketing and business environment, business community and a whole to get more people doing it. And, you know, it's pretty much the same thing that, that you're saying. And even more so, which you know, the reason why I love your seven step process is because it's not just about someone who is a job seeker to get a job. I mean, it's something that can be applied to a business owner who wants customers or clients. It can be applied to someone who already has a job, but they want to climb the corporate ladder. So, all right, how can I actually apply these steps to actually you know identify who are the people that can influence me getting a promotion or getting a raise what are their pain points um you know how can i position myself as the solution to help them alleviate these pain points or to achieve whatever goal it is they have in their position and now they'll see me as someone that you know is capable and be willing to move me up that ladder Someone who is a business owner yourself, as you said, that, you know, while you were in corporate, you were just doing the marketing, you never had to sell anything. Now that you're a small business owner, you know, you have to pick up, you know, a few lessons in sales, sales tactics, if you will. Can you share, you know, whether it's someone who is freelancing as a marketer, doing consultation work, offering marketing services as a solopreneur? if you have any practical tips that you can actually share on how they can increase revenues for their service, um, you know, probably using methods that has worked for you over the years that you could share with them. So, so first of all, again, it's, it's similar. It, it really is always the same process in the sense of you have to pick, you have to work your system daily. You have to pick, the target market that's going to buy your services and that hopefully you learn from what you've done before is probably the easiest thing, right? So if you've done, let's say in my case, I had managed a, a liquid cleaner brand, then there came another project that was for a liquid cleaner brand to do Hispanic innovation. So it's easier to sell somebody on the same industry you've already worked in because they want to look at to, to reduce their risk, right? So it's like, what target markets can you pick where you can say, I'm the solution for this type of vertical? It's okay later on, you can expand verticals, but like to go get focused. 
then you need to figure out the outcomes you create. Like I said, it, if I just said, you know, Hispanic marketing needs to happen because Hispanics are growing, which was a spiel I used in the past. That thing is like nice, but who cares if my business is still working? But if, for example, um, you know, what, some of the pain points that my clients experienced was the buyer from this retailer told me I need to launch a product and I don't want to launch a product. What do I do? So I would speak to that, right? So I would say I can avoid, help you avoid costly mistakes. Or if the buyer wants you to show you're relevant to Hispanics, I can help you put together a presentation that shows you did. You don't have to do anything yet with it in terms of like, you don't have to launch new products to prove that you're relevant to Hispanics, that your brand is. So I could sell them that. But the thing is, you always have to speak in terms that the person understands. And that's something I, it took me like 10 years to figure that out eventually. But, but I think that's critical for freelancers is like, how do you speak the pain language of the customer? So they are like, yeah, I need that. Um, and, and again, you have to, in the case of freelancers, you have to do the content marketing. You have to do the thought leadership pieces. You have to share your expertise. You have to get those people on your social media a network that are decision makers in that industry you want to target. Like I told you, I discovered like four years into like my seven year consulting career that I only had two people that could hire me in my whole network. So it's like, you know, I had to first get the people in my network, then share the content, right? So, but those are things you don't discover. You feel like you're hitting your head against the wall most of the time. And when it's like, you just have to pick a target, pick an outcome, get the people in your network, and then do that cold selling, cold email, hopefully warmer because you've shared content online and in social media that makes you credible. But, but if not, you may still be doing cold emailing and cold calling, which is painful because again, it involves rejection. But at the same time, if you have a compelling case, you know, you may get the people interested. By the way, I heard some statistic where only 3% of the people who can actually hire you to do something, have a project, have the budget, right? So it's like you have to target a hundred people to get maybe three chances. And of those three chances, you're not going to close perfectly. So to get one, you've got to do a hundred basically. Yeah. So people don't realize how much you have to do to get that one. But the thing is, once you have a system and you're working the system and you learn also about solution selling, right? Don't just go there to blab out your solution. It's like, you have to listen. Like you said, your experience was you listen first at the pain points then you present your solution as, you know, can this solution meet your needs? Sometimes it doesn't. You have to get savvy about listening for the objections. But the thing is, when you're selling as a freelancer, like you feel like your ego's on the line. So it's so painful to hear no, that you can't hear like, why is the no happening? So you then you can figure out your next step. And I think this is where partnering with other people helps because other people can be maybe a little, a little bit more dispassionate about the, the selling process. Right. And the other thing is you need to make sure you, you charge the right rate and not be ashamed of it in the sense of when I say ashamed is like, if you're delivering value, your value is going to be 10 times more than what you're charging, even if you're charging a high price. And, and initially maybe you can charge a little less if you're not confident in the value. But for example, in my case, I can avoid people a lot of mistakes, especially for example, in Hispanic marketing and innovation where like my, my fee, even of thousands of dollars for a company is peanuts compared to like what they're going to either avoid or make if they hire me. So a lot of us tend to be like, oh, people are not going to pay. See, I, it, just to give you a comparison. I have to pay an accountant to do my taxes how much money, right? In a, a good case scenario, $400 for a teeny bit of work. Sometimes people pay $400 to do like just a little W2 and some investments, right? So 
So we as consultants sometimes feel like, oh no, if I'm $300 an hour, I'm suffering. It can't be, it's too expensive. But in reality, if you're delivering the value, hey, the lawyer and the accountant, they're not reducing their $300 an hour rate. Why should we, right? But it's, you have to gain that confidence to be able to, to know that your value is way higher than what the person um, is going to pay. And also because, again, if you're very confident in your outcome, then you can stand firm also on your price. So I, I wanted to give, and I'll give email these resources to you as well, but I was, there's some resources that really helped me that are fantastic. Uh, one of them is davidafields.com. He has a book called The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients. And he has a fantastic blog. You don't even need to buy anything from these people that I'm going to tell you. You can just read a lot of what they're talking about and glean a lot. I found that I, when I invested with these people, I got my results just accelerated faster. So it, it's really, it depends what you want to do. If you want to learn and do it on your own and see if it, what, where you're stuck or if you just want to like buy whatever they have, which there a lot of things that they offer are reasonable, usually below a thousand dollars. So anyway, so he was one, his book, you can read his book first. Uh, there's doitmarketing.com um, and he's David Newman and he has a speaker and book marketing courses, which are really good. Um, he, there's linkselling.com is very good for how to build your social media network and basically sell, um, but sell more like a social selling. And then there's David Fisher from Sandler Training here in New York. Um, and he, he is about, I mean, Sandler's all about like, how do you actually sell? So these, for me, again, my personality, I'm an avid learner and reader. So for me, I needed all these structures so I can put together my system in place. And I found them very valuable because, again, these people have been around for a while. They know how to do these specific things. So for me, that's what helped me. Other people, again, as long as you have a system, that's the key. Make your own system however you want, but make us and learn from the people. You know, learn, for example, from you with how to create content that engages uh, those decision makers, you know, so then that way they can get a seat at the table to pitch their idea. Wow. <laughs> I, I must say, Sandra, I mean, you over delivered value. I mean, you talk about charging and then delivering 10X in value. I mean, you you literally charged us nothing for all the information that you shared, and I would even say you you ten times ten x um, the value that you delivered because you I mean, trust me, you you really gave a lot, even gave me a lot to think about um, to even you know how I approach doing my my content marketing um, and even how I consult with with others. So. I don't know if there's anything else. I mean, you've poured out so much. I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add before we actually end, end this conversation. You know what? I'm just so excited. Like I said, I've spent sometimes many years wandering in the wilderness. So it is so, uh, it's such a privilege to be able to come here and just share. This has been my journey. These are the, have been the things I've learned. And then hopefully people can figure out how that applies to their own journeys and their own strengths and their own process. Um, and hopefully, like I said, not have to reinvent the wheel um, and, and get ahead faster. So uh, I'm, I'm always happy to, to share any insight. So thank you for inviting me here. And thank you for, for being on. And not to worry, guys. Everything that she mentioned, as I said, I'm, I'm going to put it um, as links in the actual blog post where, where this uh, episode will be embedded. So you can look out for that episode once it's launched. Again, Sandra, thanks again for being on Conversation with Marketers. Enjoyed you, you being here, sharing with the entire community and audience that can really bring value to all of us. Great, thank you again. All right, take care. Okay, bye-bye.